Hello everyone, today we are getting started with the different animal phyla, starting with the simplest animals, peripherans, animals in the phylum periphera, also known as sponges, and then cnidarians. These are things like jellyfish and corals that are in the phylum cnidaria. The sea is silent. So that's Nidarian. So at first glance, a sea sponge might look like it's a plant. But sponges are animals because they have these four things. First, they are multicellular. What separates sponges from even more primitive colonial animals is that in sponges, we actually start to see it differentiated cells. So different cells with different functions all working together in order to keep the whole sponge body alive. Uh, they don't have any organs or body systems yet though, so that's why these are very, very primitive animals. They do cellular digestion, they are heterotrophic, they do need to eat, and they have asymmetry. So they are not radially symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical. But there's there's no really uh, real rhyme or reason to how they arrange themselves. They are asymmetrical. Sponges are sessile, meaning that they do not move, and all are filter feeders. They will suck in water and all the little plankton and particles that are floating around in the water, they will um, take in and digest. Sponges can reproduce both sexually and asexually. If they do cell reproduction, uh, sexual reproduction, they produce sperm and egg cells. Um, if they are asexual, they do regeneration. So if you were to take a piece of sponge off of this sponge and place it in another area where there was plenty of food and a good environment, then it would grow a whole new sponge. They don't have a traditional skeleton like other animals, particularly vertebrates, but they do have two main uh, structures that form the sponge and give it its shape. The first is spongin, that's the soft material, and then spicules. Spicules are like these jagged, pointy, sharp objects that um, help protect the sponge from predators and also give it some form. So here's a diagram of sponge anatomy. Um, most of the outside of the sponge is made of spongin. We can see sort of around the edge of the outer surface of the sponge, we have these white things. Those are the spicules. They are sharp and pointy and they help to provide a sort of a frame work for the sponge. The outside of the sponge is full of pores. These are called incurrent pores. They suck in water. And then the large opening, sort of at the top of the sponge, this is called the osculum. Another word for the osculum is spongocele. They mean the same thing. Sealed like coelom. So it's kind of like a coelom of a sponge. It's a, a cavity within the sponge. But for our notes, we use the term osculum most frequently. Um, and then there are some cells. We have some collar cells or choanocytes. We have pore cells, uh, porocytes, and amoebocytes. So we start to see that cellular differentiation within this animal. So how these sponges are able to filter feed is by sucking in water and releasing it through the top. So Along the edge of the sponge, the sides of the sponge, there's all these incurrent pores. Water gets sucked in through those pores, 
and goes out the top of the osculum. And the current is maintained by cells called choanocytes or collar cells. And I'm going to talk about what those do in a moment. Water and waste are going to exit through the osculum. So here is a short video clip. We have this diver with some non-toxic dye. He squirts it at the bottom of the sponge. And we can see that that dye is starting to come out the top of the osculum, uh, oscula. So we can see how that water gets sucked in through the sides of the sponge and gets released through the top. So how the sponges are able to create a current through their bodies is through these cells called choanocytes or collar cells. These are cells with flagella. Flagella are these long tails on the ends of the cells. And um, what these cells do is they'll flap their flagella. And as they move their flagella, they will push the water upward. So that way it can come in to the sponge and up through the top of the osculum. So if we go back to this picture again, we can see these choanocytes along the edge of the insides of the um, opening or the, the osculum here. And these flagella, they're going to swim. And as they swim, as they move, they're going to push the water in and up out the top of the sponge. Now, they're called collar cells because they have collars on them. And these collars are made of very small and thin fibers. And what they do is they filter food particles. This is why sponges are filter feeders. So as the water is flowing through the sponge, these food particles get trapped in this collar. And that collar is going to act like a sieve to separate all the food particles from the water. Once that collar on the choanocytes captures the food, food vacuoles in the cell are going to digest the food. So they'll digest things like plankton and other small organisms. Finally, we have cells called amoebocytes. These are cells within the sponge that move around and supply nutrients and take away waste. So you can almost think of the amoebocytes as like the sponge's circulatory system because it will take nutrients from those choanocytes and deliver it to different places throughout the sponge uh, wherever those nutrients are needed. Next, we have the cnidarians. These include animals like jellyfish, corals, hydras, and sea anemones. What these animals all have in common is that they have stinging cells found on tentacles, and these cells are called cnidocytes. Another thing that is common among cnidarians is that they are radially symmetrical, like this jellyfish. They have a wheel-shaped uh, corals, when you look at them, they might be asymmetrical if you look at the whole coral, but a coral is really a colony of many, many cnidarians. And so if you look at the small individual coral polyps that build the structure, each one is radially symmetrical. Um, so the, the entire colony might be asymmetrical, but each individual coral polyp, those have radial symmetry. They all also have tentacles, and they all also have those cnidocytes or stinging cells on their tentacles. Cnidarians have two main body forms. Um, most are this polyp shape. This is a hydra. Um, they have sort of a vase shape. Um, things like anemones and um, corals and hydras, they all have a polyp shape. 
Jellyfish have this cup shaped or medusa when they are adults. When they are first developing, they are polyps, but as adults, they form this, this bell or cup shape medusa. So all cnidarians have cells called cnidocytes. These are stinging cells. Stored inside the cnidocyte is something called an nematocyst. This is what will actually cause the sting. It's a stinging barb. So on the tentacles, we have the cnidocyte cell. And inside, coiled, is the nematocyst. And if something were to touch that cnidocyte, then the barb shoots out, causing the sting. This slide is just a quick review of how embryos develop in animals. So you have your hollow ball of cells called the blastula that will start to pinch inward um, in order to form these different layers of cells called germ layers. And these germ layers become different organs like ectoderm um, eventually. And then we have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Cnidarians only have two germ layers. They have ectoderm, which is in the red in these diagrams, and endoderm in the blue. Hmm. Um, they don't have mesoderm, but instead they have something called mesoglea, which is a jelly-like material between the endoderm and ectoderm that gives structure and support to the bodies of the cnidarians. This will also contain muscle and nerve fibers to help them move. Cnidarians are one of the first animals to have a nervous system. Sponges don't have nerves, but uh, cnidarians have what's called a nerve net. It's a primitive arrangement of nerves throughout the body that allows for the muscles to move and for the uh, uh, cnidarian to respond to stimuli. Cnidarians also don't have a digestive system like other animals. They have what's called a gastrovascular cavity. Um, their mouth and the anus is the same opening. So um, the gastrovascular cavity is responsible for both the digestion of food and the transport of nutrients throughout the body. Food goes in through the mouth. The gastrovascular cavity will digest it, absorb the nutrients, and transport those nutrients throughout the body. And then any waste comes back out the mouth the same way. So both for the polyps and the medusas. Both have a gastrovascular cavity. Hydra is one other cnidarian that is found in freshwater. It's a very small one, and we are going to uh, look at some of these under the microscope in a lab. What kind of symmetry does this hydra have? Is it a medusa or a polyp? And here is some hydra anatomy. We have our mouth that opens down into the gastrovascular cavity. We have these long tentacles that have cnidocyte cells with a nematocyst barb ready to strike. We have our two germ layers. We have our ectoderm in the white on the outside and our endoderm in the gray along here. And then in polyps, we have a very thin layer of mesoglea, which is uh, this black line that you see in between the white and the gray. Cnidarians can reproduce sexually and asexually also. Here we see a bud forming off the hyd hydra. So this is a, a mini clone of the adult hydra that's growing off the side and could eventually break off and form a new um, hydra. And then they can also reproduce sexually. So hydras do have ovaries and testes to produce eggs and sperm. Coral reefs are made from the skeletons of cnidarians. When a, a young coral polyp is floating through the ocean, it'll land on a rock. And once it lands, it'll start to secrete uh, substances to make that hard outer um, coating on it that will create the structure of the coral. 